years. And I've got Wesley and Larry to correct me, Mr. Tisner. What if I say something controversial? I will. You know, there's no T.O. Who has uh, written a class before? Who's written a subclass before? All right. So if that is our starting point, I have to take you someplace where you haven't been before. And so I'm going to try and do that today. I'm going to show you some of the common uh, patterns for, uh, for using subclasses. And then I'm going to try and retool your mind to think about them a little bit differently than you have been trained. I figure I have extra work to do because you've already used classes and subclasses before. And that extra work is to undo any previously done damage. <laughs> and so we will take you back into the inside of them and cause you to think about it in a new way, no longer conceptually, but in an operational way. What does it mean by an operational way? I once uh, read Zen in the Art of Assembly by Michael Abrash, and he was very much into optimization. He took each of these simple language instructions and went over them and said, disregard, push out of your mind what it is for. There is no what it is for. These things just cause gates to open in the machine. Know what it's for. All there is is what it does. And it was very clarifying when you removed from your mind what the things were for and used them for what they did. Like, I need a tool that causes this bit to flip there. Anything that did that was an appropriate tool. And in his case, he would always choose the fastest one because it was a game programmer. And so I'm going to help you get to that point for subclasses by stop thinking of them in the old conceptual way and giving you a new way to, uh, to look at them uh, so that you think in terms of what they do, not what they're for. So that is the promise of uh, what's ahead. Uh, so we'll revisit the notion of the class uh, with a view of deepening uh, our view of the core concepts of what they are. Uh, we'll discuss some of the use cases, principles, and design patterns. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Super, which is on my good list now. It's a few of my bad ones. Super is a fantastic tool now that I know how it works. I mentioned here a case study uh, around blue filters, but it's almost certain that uh, we won't get there. Uh, if we do, I will call it the blue filter uh, code and then ask you guys how should we design it for our subclass and what's the proper ways to subclass it? How can we future proof our code? Because if you heard my API design talk, you know, my theory is. It is the common fault of man to, when uh, designing a class, to not think of uh, uh, future, not think of subclass. Uh, today we'll teach you a couple things you can do to make life easier on this. All right, I will blow your mind with a profound example of object-oriented programming of a very sophisticated piece of code. I would like you to study it with a fresh mind. The class M scores its name has this capability, it knows how to walk. Walk, prints that it's walking, and prints its name. That is a self-contained class under itself with one useful method. I have a subclass doc, with the doc string, and a new capability, it can print this one. Okay, if you've taught object-oriented programming, somebody you probably always start with examples like it. The reason I'm starting with it here is we're going to refer to it uh, frequently and use this as the uh, tool to build, build off of. All right, so let's get some terminology down. It's amazing how many people have been programming for years but haven't heard uh, all of the terms. So we say, uh, one thing a subclass could do is add capabilities. The dog adds the bark method to animal, uh, to animal, which didn't have a bark method. So this is a new capability. It adds. <coughs> I can say, we can do some overriding. And overriding is when we make a snake subclass that replaces walk. But it has a new walk method that does slithering instead. In other words, it replaced the, the, the uh, both animal and snake have a walk method, but they do different things. That's overriding. Extending is where cat, uh, the cat subclass modifies uh, walk to add an additional capability, tail section capability, while delegating the work to the actual walking to its parent. So it actually does what its parents does and adds some extra behavior. We call that a, uh, extending. I mentioned the terminology because it gets thrown a lot, around a lot when we talk about subclasses and there's distinct meaning to adding new capabilities versus extending old and overriding with different techniques for each. Fair enough, got our terms down. I bet it's almost no one has learned anything new. However, we have clarified the terminology, we've got an example in our mind, and we're ready to talk about the patterns of subclassing. So one of the common uh, patterns for uh, subclassing is uh, a framework style. So you have a parent class, 
that essentially is self-contained. It does everything. It has all the control or logic. It does the thinking for you. My dad is the brains in my house. But I am the worker man. <coughs> Periodically when my dad says, clean the garage, he delegates that work to me. I do the work. So who's in charge in my house? My dad. He's the controller. He has, I extended his capability. He had a stub method called completing garage that did nothing. Yeah. He had himself a son who happened to have a clean garage capability, and he called that capability. So it's kind of interesting. The parent was essentially designed with subclassing in mind to send the work to a child that might not have existed at the time they got parent class uh, uh, was written. So an example of uh, this style is in simple HTTPS server, which uh, runs in a bin loop and does a lot of things to uh, uh, get request, HTTP request. And what does it do with it? It sees a get request or a uh, head request. It calls uh, its methods do get and do head, which are stub methods. They have uh, they are defined, but they are defined as pass. So this server serves, but does nothing without any other request. To use this server, you make a subclass of uh, HTTPS simple server, simple <coughs> server, and you def uh, supply the missing methods. So the subclasser finds do get or uh, do put uh, or do head, takes the appropriate action, and now the server does something. Much like my father suddenly gained the ability to clean garages when his son was born. Fair enough? Okay, so this is a common pattern in Python, and it is a, uh, a style of designing for subclasses. Let's use the uh, CMD module. Okay. So it's a fantastic uh, piece of code. Um, I love the module because if you like hard parse, you should also like um, uh, command.py. Because if you've gone to the trouble of parsing the uh, command line, it, you've already got methods to do all of the work. So if you've provided a command line interface, you might as well uh, attach command.py and also uh, create a shell interface so a person can fire it up and create some uh, variables on the fly and run the methods one at a time so they don't have to do independent implications uh, from the command line. So it's a very easy way to add extra capabilities to your program. If you've gone to the trouble of putting in RA parts, it's perfectly easy to put in a command. How does it work? Well, command uh, in the module has a, a big class and uh, that has lots of controller type capabilities. Along the way, it says, I'm going to run one command. It accepts a command from raw input. So the command comes in as a string. It splits its string and pulls an R again. So you're, again, you're making a shell. Someone's typed something into the shell, a command with an argument. It is dispatched to something that doesn't exist in this class. It calls get adder for do underscore that command. So if your command is pinned down, if you're writing a, uh, a shell for a turtle, and someone types pinned down, it will feed into here with no argument, go into uh, the get adder, it'll prefix it with do, the get adder will look in self, and what is self? Self is not this class, self is the subclass. The subclass, it will look down and see if it finds a method called do underscore uh, pinned down. So that's the way you extend uh, command.py. You subclass it, and then you add methods like do pin down, and suddenly it has a pin down capability, which is fantastic. Yeah. My thought is lots of you learned something new. Let me check. You learned something new. Okay, about half. All right, so it's a fantastic tool. I recommend it highly, and this is a pattern of subclassing uh, that is underutilized for uh, adding new capabilities uh, for subclassing put in a uh, uh, dynamic dispatcher, and then your subclasses are free to add lots of new commands uh, uh, to your tool. It's a great way of doing new extensions. All right. Let's start to get into innards and look at uh, what we call patterns for subclass. So I've got myself a circle class. It knows its radius, it its area in the traditional manner, and it has a river that says, ah, uh, I have an area. I have a subclass donut. That also stores an inner and an outer radius of the donut, and its area function uh, computes the outer radius uh, and it subtracts the inner radius, computing the uh, outer area and the inner area, and takes the difference of them, computing the area of the donut. Fantastically marvelous, sophisticated function. Thank you. Why is here? 
is to show the patterns of calls of the relationships. So one interesting part of the is if we call, uh, take an instance of data and call its wrapper method, we look up, it doesn't have a wrapper method, it goes to the parent class circle. Circle's wrapper uh, method calls self.area. What is self? Self is not an instance of circle. You're going to hear me say some variation of this many times. Self is not always the class that is defined. In. Self belongs to the subclass. So when you do self, you don't know who you are at the time you're writing it. You know it's one of your, or your progeny, one of your children, but it might not be you. So we call uh, self.area. And where is self.area find? find the search starts at the bottom and works its way up. So this area is not the one it's called, which is kind of surprising to the author of the circle class, who pretty much intended for this to call that. You have overwritten, you have changed the operation of the wrapper method by giving it a new area. You guys come to lightning talks this week? Did you like them? Did you learn anything new? Yep. Probably. I made this slide a very few minutes ago. <laughs> so, my new tool that I learned was interactive.ly. Diag, which was pronounced EA by the person who presented it. So it enabled me to make this little diagram that said I've got a dumb instance. This colleague's wrapper who calls the uh, uh, parent circle who calls back up. I thought it was kind of cool that I could make that little diagram in just a uh, few minutes before the presentation. The important point is, okay, our main points are this self doesn't necessarily refer to circle. This self can actually refer to a donut. This area might not refer to this area. It might refer uh, to this one. And so you can have a bouncing up and down between the behaviors uh, of <laughs> one method. There are interdependencies between methods calling each other, which presents opportunities and challenges and techniques, which we will go into shortly. The other thing to notice here is that um, the init method for Donna extended the init method for uh, a circle. So it called its parent. It did its parents' activity and then added its extra capability of showing up, uh, saying its uh, inner radius. And so that was an extend. This one could be called an extend or it could be called an override because uh, it actually does call it to the parent. But it does it by not calling itself. I would call this overriding. Essentially, it's one forming two new circles and then taking the difference up. So self is not used here. So I would call this more overriding than extending. So there's going to be a lot of bouncing up and down. What I want to try to do is give you a new way of thinking about uh, what's going on, on here so that you stop thinking in terms of this self being that, and so that you stop thinking in terms of this area being this one, and that every, it's very natural for us to think when we're writing one piece that all the interesting activity occurs at our level when in fact it bounces up and down. <coughs> Time to retool our thinking about subclasses. So, take everything you know about classes and subclasses and grace. <laughs> what does it mean to be an object or class? First uh, principles. One common definition of an object is an it, it is an entity that encapsulates data together with functions, of, uh, which we call the methods, for manipulating that data. So, when you, ever, you start learning about OCO programming, one of the first words you get hit with is encapsulation. The idea is the data and the methods that manipulate them are together. How do we arrange those implementation-wise? Implementation-wise, it will be one word I use. The other equivalent word I'm going to use a lot is called operational. Operational means what does it do or how does it do it, not why does it do it or what is it for. The specific, this thing calls that is operational. This thing calls that because it's conceptual. We're going to have two different levels and we're going to see how they compete. The part where we get confused is when we form concepts that don't actually correspond to what things actually do. So the way to uh, implement uh, this, or the way we've chosen to implement it, is uh, a chain of dictionaries, which here with my advanced class, we've actually built this up. So you have three dictionaries for three different instances, and they have all of the data for those instances. And in addition, they have a pointer, and they point to another dictionary. What does that dictionary have in it? 
that dictionary has all of the functions, uh, which we call methods in object-oriented programming. So one dictionary of functions, three dictionaries of data. So we're going back to first principles. We're erasing everything else we knew about object-oriented programming. Piles of dictionaries. One collects all the functions. One collects, uh, another collects all of the uh, data. With me? All right. So if that, uh, we've defined what it means to be an instance. The thing has the data. And what does it have in addition to data? A pointer to the parent. What does it mean to be a class? A class is just a dictionary full of functions. With that, what does it mean to be a subclass? A subclass is just a class that delegates its work to another class. This is the conceptual shift. Um, we'll, we're going to see some variant of this several times. So, parent class is also a dictionary that control, uh, has a bunch of functions. The subclass has a pointer to the parent dictionary. <coughs> so, these guys have a pointer to the parent. That arrow. So, this slightly new way of thinking about what's going on inverts our normal understanding of what's happening with uh, some subclass. The subclass points to its parent. The parent's not pointing to the subclass. The usual way to draw these diagrams is with the arrow going the other way. You have the class, and the arrow goes down to uh, from animal to dog, and then from dog to its instance. So those arrows go the wrong way. The reason they go the wrong way is the arrow is stored here, it goes up. The arrow is stored here, it goes up. Why is that important? Because we had this notion from earlier in the class that my dad somehow ran my household. Who runs the household? Man, quite a rule. This thing can change its class. We can have it point at another pile of functions. This thing can point at another parent if it wants to. That parent is its slave. It is the thing that it delegates to. It says, I could conceptually have a long list of functions over here, but really, I'm just going to store two, and anytime I don't know one, I will delegate the work up here. So this new view says, who's in charge? The subclass is in charge. And in our code, when we see self, is it our self? No, it is potentially one of our, uh, our progeny. These are the two new concepts from trying to change your thinking about what you already knew. So we've highlighted here the important part of uh, what's going on. Cloud subclass is just, another, it's just like a class. It's a collection of functions. But it has this capability of it delegates work to some other class. Which is kind of cool, because when you think about delegation, you think of it as this arrow is re easily repointed to a number of places. It can point back to itself, it can point out to some external class, basically any other parallel function somewhere else is a candidate for being uh, delegated work to. This is going to become important when we get super, and what we're going to do is take in between these two, we're going to stick to a new class. Class that was not anticipated by this one or this one, we will stick a new one in between and we will change uh, who has been delegated to. We'll uh, do that to a great and fantastic effect. So, Raymond's definition of what is subclassing. Subclassing is basically a tool for code reuse. We're saying, I have a whole bunch of functions that were also useful over here. Rather than rewrite them, I'm simply going to point to them and delegate them. And this is kind of an operational definition of subclassing. It's, what does it do? Subclassing, all it does is take a pile of functions that's somewhere else that I was thinking about rewriting and sends the work over there. Notice I've mentioned nothing about my parent being in charge. He has some interface I need to follow. None of this stuff. I'm in charge. I'm deciding who gets delegated. I could have written all of these functions myself and not accepted something from the parent. <coughs> Classes are very full of functions, and it's kind of nice to change some of them together so that you don't, you don't have to repeat functionality. Subclassing is simply a, code, a tool for code reuse. Who's had their mind expanded ever so slightly but hasn't yet seen why it's profound? Okay. Fair enough. So, hit it with a little operational slide and we'll kind of delve down into principles and whatnot. So, I want to contrast two views of uh, of subclasses. There's the operational view we just learned. Subclasses are just dictionaries of functions. Subclasses are also dictionary functions, but they have a pointer to another dictionary that has some, uh, so that they can reuse that other dictionary's code. Who's in control? A subclass is in complete control of what happened. Contrast that with the traditional conceptual view of what subclasses are for or what they do. The 
traditional view is parents, parent classes define an interface. Subclasses uh, extend that interface. My dad is in charge. So the traditional view is that subclasses are just specializations of their parents. A dog is simply an instance of animal that has the additional capability or specialization in a set of bar. A counter is just an instance of a dictionary that has a default of zero. And a name tuple is just an instance of a tuple that also has uh, attribute access. That is normally the way we think about these things. And what I'm trying to change for you is that when we want to do something cool with subclasses, when we want to think about their design, when we want to think about the art of subclassing, it really helps to think about the operational view that it's the subclass that's in charge. And if the parent knows that, it can actually help out the subclass by making it easier to subclass. And if the subclass realizes that it's in charge, it can do a lot of wonderful things. Fair enough? All right. So we've tried to take the conceptual view, which is probably deeply rooted in your mind, and undermine it ever so slightly and give you an operational view that says, maybe there's a set of tools I can reconnect however I want. If I get you to that point, you'll be able to do some great things uh, with the classes. So let's go look at some of the traditional rules with uh, subclasses and when to break them. Um, and the implications of each. So, it's my understanding it is not commonly known exactly what the Liskov substitution principle is. If you look it up, uh, I think Barbara Liskov's <coughs> original statement of it back in 1987 was if, a, if S is a subtype of T, then objects of uh, type T may be replaced with other objects of S. Essentially, what that means is whatever my dad does, my dad has a lot of jobs, a lot of friends, a lot of places he goes, and things that he does can have an expectation that I, as his son, will be able to do everything he does plus some additional capabilities. But at least whatever he does, if I show up for, uh, for my dad's job, they expect me to do my dad's work. Fair enough? That's the list called substitution principle. It's an ideal. So the uh, example over here is we have a function named pet. It accepts an animal and it prints out the animal's name. Fair enough that the animal is a very simple class. But I can also pass in an instance of dog, the subclass of animal, and I expect this function to work, even if this function was written prior to dog having been written. What do we need for this to, uh, to work? We need dog to have been designed in a way that was intentionally substitutable for its parent. It said, I know there are lots of places in my code base, perhaps thousands of places in my code base, that are trained to work with animals it is my expectation that the subclass will work. Uh, work with. That's one of the principal reasons for the subclass, especially built in. We specialize behavior in built in, and we pass it in and hope that it works uh, uh, everywhere. So it is vital for some of our subclasses. Like order dick, the thing that made it uh, cool, besides just keeping its ordering, was if I had made it to where I didn't connect to anything else in the universe, it would have been a problem. Other classes would have slowly had to become order dick aware. But because it was a Dix subclass, right away, everything in Python that was designed to work with Dix already worked with ordered Dix, which is great, because those things were designed before ordered Dix. Ordered Dix came later. So that's the reason for the list of substitution principle is the idea that your subclass is maximally useful in lots of existing code if it is fully substitutable. It's an ideal. It's a nirvana. Why do we care about Liskov? Uh, it's all about polymorphism and substitutability. So we get lots of fine code, stick the subclass in, and use it without changing. So, uh, one of the classic examples is if you've got a large body of code for a cash register and uh, calls a method on an object called accept payment. Originally, it might be just be that object it might be a cash object. And accept payment is automatically true. And many uh, only rejects if you don't have sufficient change available for the transaction. But later you can add in other polymorphic objects like uh, credit card transactions and money order transactions and whatnot and have them flow through the code without changing any of the client code that uses it. So you can add new payment types without changing your entire system, which was a fantastic improvement over the old style of using lots of different analysis throughout the code. Every time you added a new case, you have to go change every if then and else. More importantly, once we've written the credit card class, we can subclass it and specialized behavior, specialized handling for Amex versus Visa versus uh, MasterCard. So, Liskov gives a substitute, 
Substitutability. Substitutability is a big win. Lots of code in Python works for dictionaries. Ordered dict is a dict subclass. Therefore, right away it works throughout. So you can use it with the JSON loader, uh, use it with config app parser, and those are prime use cases for it. That's what it wins. It's our ideal. Would you ever make something that is not list call substitute? Do you have a list call violation? And yes, it's actually extremely common to have list call violations. Why would I do such a thing if I just told you that substitutability is a good thing? Well, it's kind of a gray scale. The more substitutable, the better, but sometimes you have to make a change. So one of the most common uh, uh, changes is the constructor signature. So a good example is uh, list and arrays. So array objects have an interface that is almost exactly like list. They can use, be used just about everywhere list can. However, the constructors differ. One of them takes a, some, uh, some iterable and turns it into a list. The other one takes an iterable and a uh, code that says this is a character array or an array of doubles or whatnot, a particular type. So it's very space efficient uh, storage of the list. We knew about array already. So who, I said I thought about it in terms of its quirk. Its quirk is its constructor signature is different from the list itself. Why is that a problem? Well, if a piece of code needs to create a new list, it needs to have some way of doing it without calling the constructor. It can't duplicate this array and make another array out of it because it didn't know the signature. So that's a problem for subclasses. We've limited the use of array to only cases uh, where the there are lots of cases that don't need a new constructor, but when we do, uh, arrays can't be used, and we've uh, defeated it. So, Raymond, yep. you said this kind of said that instances are replaceable. So, uh, I, 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 I should say subclasses were actually her terminology. Okay. Spoke in terms of type. It was that quote, that quote I presented was the exact quote. The important thing for us right now is the notion of substitutability. The instances of the type are substitutable where the parent instances of the parents uh, were expected. All right, so if we're going to have a list code violation, our goal becomes to minimize its impact. One place that is hit really hard by this is in the uh, abstract base class for mutable sets. How many of you guys used, used ABCs? Okay. So it's a fantastic new uh, concept in Python. It is. Uh, if you've ever used user dict mixin, it is that concept writ, writ large. The idea is it is a mixin class where you supply a couple of methods and it supplies all the remaining methods for you. So for a uh, mutable dict, for example, you supply uh, under get item, under set item, under del item, and iter, and it figures out all of the rest for you and it gives you the entire mapping interface for free. In addition, it allows us to override uh, his instance and his subclass ethos, that's what I mentioned before, is the new duck typing. It's a fantastic thing. Our problem was the implementation of mutable set. The idea was, here's a mix-in where you should be able to define uh, some minimal set of characteristics about a set and then get all of the set operations for free. Things like union, intersection, and uh, uh, difference. Problem with operations like union, intersection, and difference. You take two sets and you take the union of them, what have you created? You've created a new set. How does mutable set how, know how to do that? Because your uh, mutable set is simply abstract. It doesn't implement the uh, class. You're going to do that uh, using the framework pattern that I discussed earlier. You're going to define the getter. You're going to define the constructor. And you're going to define the uh, contains method. And I'm going to try and give you these others for free. So I know how to do union. I uh, iterate over one, iterate over the other, take the combination of two after eliminating duplicates, and then I go to build a new set. But I don't know how to do that. And the reason I don't know how to do it is I can't possibly anticipate what your constructor signature is going to be. Possibly, you have put a C in front uh, as a type code, just like we did with the right. So what do I do? Our solution, if you look at the uh, code for our abstract base classes, is we introduced a new method called from interval with an underscore. So it's an internal. Uh, method is not really part of the published API except for the purpose of the subclass. And the idea is every one of these operations that creates a new set builds up the information for it and feeds it into from iterable. From iterable is, has a guaranteed signature of it takes one argument, 
which is an interval, and it produces uh, a new set. How can I produce a new set if I don't know the signature? You will override uh, from interval when you're subclassing a beautiful set. And so what I've done is taken all of the many pointers into the constructor, which could all could have been broken if you, you know, so union, difference, and intersection all needed to call the constructor. So three different calls in. Your constructor is going to have the wrong signature, breaking all three. So instead, I point all three to this other method called from interval. So you can fix it in one place and transform whatever your constructor is, wrap it around from interval. So I isolated the effect of the change. Who learned a new technique? Okay. That was a Quido idea, and it was a fantastic idea. What's the code roughly look like? Uh, the idea is if I'm going to inherit a mutable set, which is my mix in, I go ahead and provide some uh, edit function as a constructor, and which has a signature <coughs> that sets itself, where I'm reporting the type. And then I do other things to initialize based on whatever that type is. Then I override, uh, not extend, override from interval. And I take whatever interval is being sent in by uh, the union or intersection or difference. I look at the first element, I check its type, and then I build the type set, and so I'm able to return a new one. And in that way, all of the other methods that you've inherited, uh, set union, set difference, set intersection, they all work. Fair enough? Yeah. Learn something new? Yeah. Why are you passing the uh, self in the left line to return to the construct of type set? Probably not an excellent idea. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, because when you see slides, they have dot to dot in it. It means they haven't actually run the code. So <laughs> <laughs> my human interpreters and compilers, and you have afforded me a syntax error, which I can go and uh, edit the slide, which unfortunately I've showed as a stored as an image instead of as code. So I have time to regenerate the image. In three dot two, uh, three dots would work, or? Huh? Oh yes. And uh, the interesting thing is, in three dot two, uh, dot 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 is now a valid expression. Uh, so this one would not fail, <laughs> which I think is kind of uh, interesting. Okay, so you guys learned a new technique. Is if you must have a Liskov violation, the idea is to isolate its impact by having everything point to the one function, to some intermediary function, uh, so that uh, when someone changes the signature of what's underneath, uh, you only have to fix it in, in one place. All right. Now, on back to these conceptual issues, because now we've learned this cost substitution principle. Yeah, we're not going to adhere to it all the time. It's quite normal to make a, uh, a constructor that's uh, uh, different. And it's causing us to question our own whole intellectual framework. Let's question it further. It was known as the circle ellipse problem and square rectangle problem, which Larry will talk to you about more tonight. So in mathematics, a circle is just a special case of an ellipse for the major and minor axis happen to be equal. The question for you is, uh, circle an appropriate subset of the class ellipse? Well, we know that if uh, the ellipse stretches one axis, what does that mean for uh, circle instances? If we can skew ellipses, the circles don't skew into circle. That's a problem. The problem here is that circles have less information than an ellipse. An ellipse has stored two different radiuses, major axis and uh, minor axis. The circle has one. And it has constraints that don't uh, apply to general ellipses, like circles have the constraint. They are all uh, locus of points equidistant from a given point. So what's the solution? We could reverse the classes and say an ellipse is a special case of circle. But that is also uh, problematic, because circles have capabilities that don't apply uh, to ellipses. Circles are fantastic because the bounding box for them is guaranteed to be square, for instance. A lot of great things you can do with circles if you can't do with ellipses. So what are our lessons? Yes, sir. Oh, that was a yawn and not a question. I see how it goes. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's a good thing. I think I would really have the question. I should dance for you. It's after lunch, you have to wine. <laughs> <laughs> we need so some more air, I guess. You can watch it later. <laughs> All right. What are the lessons that we learned from the circle of legs problem? What are the takeaways? The takeaways is if you meditate on this deeply, because this is the Zen cone of uh, uh, subclassing, meditate on the sound of <coughs> one hand clapping. Who's the parent? Circle or the ellipse? Circle or ellipse? 
meditate on it deeply, and it will take you to this special place that will undermine all these unhelpful notions that you've got about subclasses. Like, oh, it's a great way to rec uh, represent a uh, taxonomy. I have this nice taxonomy of uh, shapes, squares, circles, our special cases of ellipses and whatnot, and we find that taxonomies often don't map neatly onto uh, our class our, our hierarchies, in part because substitutability can be a problem. You know, we have class bird. Class bird has a method called fly. In this instance, a uh, subclass of class bird is penguin. Oh, we've got a problem, substitutability issue. Essentially, what we've done here is challenge our conceptual view of a subclass as simply a form of specialization. It can be used that way. There are designs that work like that, but not all of them. It's not the universal way to do this. So I would like to undermine your conceptual view of subclasses as a form of uh, specialization. So if I undermine your viewpoint, how do I get you your clarity back? <coughs> it's to think in terms of operation. What is subclassing all about? It has nothing to do with uh, specialization. Subclassing is all about code reads. We have piles of functions and dictionaries. There happens to be a function in another dictionary that I'm interested in. Rather than I recode it, I am going to delegate my work to it. Subclassing is all about delegating work to somebody else's uh, function. With me? And that is a clarifying notion that will tell you what to do in all cases of confusion with things like the circle and the lips problem. It will tell you which one goes on top because you'll ask yourself which one has the in my use case for circles and ellipses, whatever my use case is, I'll ask myself which one has the code that's most reusable uh, for uh, both objects. And I will call that one the parent class and the other one the subclass. There's no conceptual difficulty there. I want to maximize code reuse. And with that as my objective, it clarifies how I design my subclasses. Who has cracked through the eggs, stuck their head out, and seen a new world? <laughs> OK, a handful. I'll make you progress. I'll go back to professorial principles, which I must call substitution principle. How about the open close principle? The open close principle, and I quote, says, software classes, entities, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension but closed for modification. That seems straightforward enough, however, because it's been interpreted differently at different times in history. One use of it that is not the use I'm making is some people call the open close principle a <coughs> admonition to always define the action of a class in terms of an abstract base class, and then any concrete class is just a different implementation of that class. So I have a mapping interface, and I have five different uh, implementations, possibly with different characteristics for memory use and speed and whatnot, but they are all otherwise the same. It comes from a rule view that says the list of all substitution principles and rules should never be violated, ever, not even one little bit. But do we live in that world, Emma? Nope. All right, so my view of it, uh, and I don't know whether this was the more modern view or the more ancient view, uh, it is that objects have internal invariants, relationships between the methods and relationships with their, uh, with their data. And ideally, we don't want a subclass to come along, change one of the methods, and break the uh, parent class. I can do things my dad can't, garage cleaning, for example. But my, by my doing that, I'm not going to break what my dad can do. Yet there are class designs where as soon as you inherit one of the methods, you break all the rest of the class. The open close principle suggests that we should not uh, um, design our classes that way. Who does this? We do. Teach you the facts of the uh, subclass and how to build things. What we would like to do before we learn the facts of life is we like to make ourselves a case instance to dictionary. Uh, override, uh, or rather extend, uh, get item, set item, we'll lowercase the key, and then uh, delegate the work. What is subclassing all about? It says, I want to be as capable as a dictionary, I can write all of the dictionary methods, but I'm just going to delegate the actual dicting work up, and the only part I'm going to do is the lowercase. Remember, the whole reason this part is here is code reuse. Otherwise, we can fill in everything ourselves. So we make ourselves a case instance dictionary. We put in Django with a capital D and sign it to Pony. Works. I go look it up with uh, several uppercase letters. It works. We're very happy with our class until we try D.Kit. Now we go look up and it uses uh, the default. Why is it not found? This get item was not respected. Get did not internally call our under get item. 
Who was outraged? Who was angry? <laughs> As you should. Oh wait, maybe Plato did this for a reason. And the reason was, uh, as we put things in and out of the dictionary, it has to maintain internal invariance, the shape of the hash table, knowing how many poles are inside, knowing its own length and whatnot. And possibly, you could come along and make some method that broke one of those invariants. And uh, the get relied on your get item, and it was also supposed to do some sort of update inside. Get doesn't, but pop does, pop item does. They do things on the inside that were they to respect your get item would actually break the dictionary as well and we'd see what happens if we well, uh, we break the invariant. Set call. Uh, good thing. We strive very hard to make it uh, difficult for you to set call uh, unless you're really trying to do it on purpose. But we try to keep it where it doesn't happen to you accidentally. So this uh, class, dict, is open for extension. We just did an extension but it was closed for modification. You can't actually make, uh, change how get works inside. You can't extend get, which you probably should in this case. So the facts of life are one, that uh, Guido followed the open closed principle, and he closed off the dict class. You cannot control the internal relationships between get and get out. And even if you could, how would you know which one was the root method? Maybe underneath the hood, get items implemented in terms of get, or get is implemented in terms of get item. You wouldn't even know which one to overwrite. You have to open the internals of the code and show the uh, implementation. New things revealing all your implementation details is a good thing. All right. We are all students of uh, Dr. Parnas, who learned the term information hiding. Information hiding in a good way. So the facts of life for dictionaries are the built-ins are open for extension, closed for modification. Therefore, if you want to make this and have the full dict API, you will need to over also uh, extend get, pop, yada yada yada. Basically, every uh, thing that is affected, you won't have to override enter are our enter values, but uh, everything that is affected by whatever change you make. Okay. So we learned something new with facts of life. Are you still outraged? Probably so. All right. OCP, open closed principle. If Guido did it, we'd like to do it too, because Guido's lighted the way. He wants to close his classes. We need to close ours. How do we do it? We gave you a tool. And the tool is called uh, uh, the under under for naming. So a method named under under up, update in the class called my dick is transformed inside to under my dick and under under update. And the creative monster, you can actually do this mangling yourself and reach inside a class and violate, violate his privacy. But this isn't about privacy. Otherwise, we could have locked it up tight so you couldn't get to it. I could have put a character in there that was uh, not a uh, normal character for uh, attributes. You could put an ampersand in there. You wouldn't be able to get to it. It wasn't about protection. It is about making that class close for extension. So the way to use that Let's say I make myself a little dictionary. It has uh, an int method and it accepts an interval. It would like to, this interval should be passed down to it. Okay. So when I initialize it, the interval is going to be uh, sent over to update. Fair enough, because I don't want to write the code for update twice. Now I write my update the regular way. Now here's the trick. I do under under update equal update. What that has done for me is it took a copy of this one, stuck it right here, and when this calls this one, even if a subclass uses under under update, it'll have a different name, therefore a different mangling. This one is protected. This thing is always guaranteed to call this, which is guaranteed to call this. So if a sub subclass overrides update, which it's allowed to do, because I want to be open for extension, it can change its update all at once. Functions counter does that. Functions counter has an update that has a different signature uh, than dict. So it can override update, but not accidentally kill an it. Because it's kind of a bummer if you a subcluster comes along and uh, says, I just want to change what update does, and they ended up killing an it. Remember that bouncing up and down before? We did that little exercise for a reason. The reason was to show <coughs> bouncing up and down could have killed the internals. Uh, five minutes. All right. You got the gist here? I'd like to see this technique used somewhat uh, uh, broadly. Uh, we started using it uh, inside the collections module extensively with the idea of making it easier for you to subclass any of those without breaking them internally. You can extend them, 
that it goes through modification. You learn something new, plus EP, fucking plus principle. And now you know what the uh, double under is actually for. It is not for protection. It is for closing off your class so that the internal calls will likely do what you expect them to, so the internal invariance won't break. There's a decision-making process you have to do, which is perhaps you want it so somebody can change update, and this one will change too, in which case the original design was fine. You would probably want to document, by the way, if you change update, you have to change an it. So it's part of the contract. Otherwise, the presumption of the subclass are that won't happen. All right, what Python Super can do? Python Super has a super power. What did we learn earlier about um, uh, delegation error? Uh, counter inherits from dict. What does that mean? Is it a dict? Is it a specialization? No. It is something that's somewhat lazy. It does. Has this extra capability of hand, uh, supplying a zero for you, and it has a couple convenience methods. Everything else it delegates all its work to some type of mapping object, and by default, that some type of mapping object is a dict. But we can change that pointer. Remember, this is just a dictionary full of functions, and accompanied by a pointer to another dictionary that is going to do all the actual mapping work. So, with that mental framework, we say, you know what? We can change that pointer. Let's point it to some other type of thing that supplies a mapping interface, like an ordered dict. A new delegation. Get rid of that one, supply this one, and now we have an ordered counter without having changed the code for the counter. Counter, its contract with its parent is, I expect you to do dictionary-like things. Obey a dict uh, API. I don't actually care if you're a real dict. I am going to delegate work to you, whoever you are, and your promise to me is you will do some mapping-like thing. And the default for that was a regular dict. Change the default. Something else that fulfills the same contract. How do we do that? It takes one line. Class ordered counter, and here's some counter and order dict. If you read my super considered super uh, blog post, you'll learn the mechanics of how that works. It's actually not that hard. It's a little shocking to the mind when you first see it, but this one line builds a completely new functionality by changing this pointer to this one so that uh, we get fantastic new capabilities. That would be entirely mind-blowing if you had old-style thinking of, this thing is just a specialization of the, it doesn't fit. This thing is something that's lazy, hands off its work to somebody else, and then somebody else can change. You're fired, you're hired. With me? Okay. Did you sort of learn something new about how that works, how to conceive of it, how to think of it, and why it might actually be a reasonable thing to do? All right, fantastic. All right. And uh, a couple more thoughts. One is beware of the concrete CAPI. It is not your friend. Because we don't see it, but I come to hate it. <coughs> now I should be thankful for it, because in the beginning all we had was dict set item and list append, and we didn't have abstract types or the ability to subclass. But when those others came along, these guys survived. What did they do? Well, I dict a set item, sets an item in a dictionary, I list append, appends to a list. Simple enough, except they also accept subclasses of dict and subclasses of all this, and they don't care. They go internally and do their things the way that they always did, meaning there is nothing you can do, whether you're coding in C or whether you're coding in Python, to create a subclass of list or dict and have your internal invariants get respected. These things will come right in and add an item. Let's say your class adds the items it tries to keep track of the number of items or the number of even entries that have gone in or something like that. My list of panel come in, put it in, and bypass all of your code. Meaning it is impossible to uh, uh, make a subclass that is uh, shielded from these things. And lots of third party extensions use these directly. I've tried it internally in Python to not use this at all. We only use it when we know that uh, we have an exact dictionary or an exact uh, subclass. It's a little respect your, uh, your invariance. There are certain third party modules at all. The concrete C API is your friend. If you are writing C code, please do not use it. Pretend it does not exist. All right. Summary. Writing the subclasses with subclasses in mind. You should isolate your a API assumptions. So when you have a list called violation, do something like mutable set uh, under from miterable, where you've isolated the impact of the change in a single place. You made likely zero subclass. You're protecting your internal calls, like we did with order dict under under update, so that you are uh, open for extension and close with close for modification. Ideally, you should be using uh, super uh, when you delegate to another class, because super is something that's retractable, allows that pointer to move, like we did with uh, 
uh, the counter class, how we changed it from pointing to Dick as the delegate to uh, count. So you enable that whenever you use uh, super. That's a pretty fine thing. Normally you don't care about it when you write the class, but the subclass are uh, uh, here. So if you're designing the class and subclassing in mind, we'll do that. And then uh, you can pick specific methods that were designed to be overwritten, like do get. You can make a class extendable with dynamic uh, dispatch, like that command.py does. Just use a, uh, a get adder lookup, and that way your subclasses are even more extendable. And then you will follow Alex's advice to provide hooks, override, write, overrides, controllable delegation, dependency injection for every piece of functionality that a subclasser might want to change. And I believe it is the common fault of man to when they finish a class and get it to uh, uh, pass the test, they think they're done. But it takes so little effort to look back through your class and say, did I use super? Did I protect my internal calls? Did I isolate the API associates? Did I take any internal functionality and not provide a hook to it so the class could override it? At that point, you can say your class is closed, uh, uh, closed for modification, open for extension, and subclass friendly. I hope everything goes up when I ask, did you learn something new? All right. Fantastic. And then the uh, principles for writing subclasses. So the previous slide was writing the superclass. Subclass is list called substitution principle. And remember, as a subclasser, you're the one in control. You're driving. You control where this delegation happens. You can change your parents. Uh, your subclassers can change uh, what you thought your parents was. Subclasses run the show, not the parents. And the principle for designing uh, uh, these classes is to stop thinking in terms of specialization, stop thinking in terms of this thing is a parent, this is a son, and think strictly in terms of what maximizes code reads. That's why we do this, not because inheritance is cool or because it's uh, taxonomy is intrinsically mapped onto uh, inheritance. Well, that's not the case. Taxonomies, taxonomies don't cleanly map onto uh, classes. Think about code, code reads, you'll have good design. Think about uh, all of these other concepts, which aren't always true, not so good. And the uh, last thing to know is when writing a subclass, like when you're subclassing a built-in, you need to overwrite every single method that needs to change. You know, uh, rely on implicit or undocumented relationships between uh, uh, method calls. Come on, Dave, we're post. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah. All right. Inheritance does for you. 
better to use the system that was uh, designed for you by Quido and throw it all away, rewrite your own, and possibly make logic error along the way. But yes, I do understand your, uh, your school of thought that says pig sins are evil. Uh, well, prominent Python people are among them, like Caleb and Yanato, uh, thinks that it's a, a mess and he is both right and wrong. He's wrong because I've seen good examples that work fine. He's also right because we've seen plenty of examples where people tie themselves in nuts. I, I'm very much uh, a fan of operational uh, well, way of looking at things, but what we end up with in an extreme case is uh, I don't know what to call it, mixing, which has just uh, two methods uh, that I needed in several of my classes, which are not related in any way. All right, so like all of our design, we have to document the interfaces and say what the contracts are. Like in the case of the counter, in particular, I want to say. What it means for me to inherit from Dick is I now have a contract with some other class to provide me with mapping uh, functionality, and I expect it to have full mapping API. I don't care which one it is, but I have a contract with it. And knowing that contract allows me to substitute with impunity. And then there's also some reliance on test cases, but that's a general software design problem. I'm not really to this. Fair enough? Okay. This one is running late. It's done.